work. There we go. Good evening. Now everyone online can hear us as well. So glad that you're here to join us in worship and that we can all join in worship, whether we're on site or online, to worship our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in this place. Today we continue our midweek Lenten series, The Places of the Passion. We're on midweek five, not midweek four, as your bulletin says. This is the last midweek service as we go through the places of the Passion before next week, which brings us Palm Sunday and Monday Thursday and Good Friday and all of those wonderful opportunities to worship and celebrate as we lead up to Easter Sunday. As we think on today's place of the Passion, we enter the courtroom, the trial of Jesus before Pilate and Herod, and we see in this trial the will of man, but even more, we see God's saving will for us. And so it's as we think on all of these things that I now invite you to stand for our Lenten sentences. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let us pray. Almighty God, you seek not our death or destruction, but our life and salvation. Speak your word of rescue to our sin-sick hearts and our fearful souls. Call us forth from the darkness of our guilt and shame and bring us into the light of your presence where your forgiveness dwells. Restore us to your people that our wandering ways may end Direct us to the path your Son has made, that we may walk in it by faith and never depart from its hope. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We join in our entrance hymn.
Let us pray. Faithful Lord, our sinful hearts have taught us to fear your will and to exchange the pleasant lies we tell ourselves for the sturdy truth of your word. Give us faith in your will and help us to know the triumph of your mercy toward those who deserved only judgment, condemnation, and death. Help us to see how all things worked according to your saving plan in Christ our Savior, and give us hope to continue to believe you are working good in every circumstance and situation of our mortal lives. Help us to trust you in the daily routines of our life, just as we trust you, trust you for eternal life. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight we'll be reading through Luke chapter 22, and our first reading begins with verses 63 through 71. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept on asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When the day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together both chief, chief priests and scribes. And they led him away to their council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, You are the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Continue our reading. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. And they said that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priest and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other.
continue with our final reading. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And he said to them, You brought me this man as one who is misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they had asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to you to imagine, as we think on the gospel story that we just heard in three parts, the media frenzy that would occur if this trial were televised. What would CNN be talking about? What would Fox News say? What would the voices on Twitter be tweeting? and Facebook be obsessing over? What would the pundits on Reddit have to, to convey about what's going on here, the intrigue, the power plays, the greed, the anger? For as distant as what I just suggested may seem, there's an awful lot of all of that in this story already. Luke fills us in on all of the juicy details that we probably don't even expect from this story. 
Herod wanted things, Pilate wanted things, and they, they had a relationship of enmity to prior, prior to the trial, yet they become friends over Herod's mistreatment of Jesus. All the while, Luke never lets us forget the anger of the chief priests and the scribes and the teachers of the law, the shouting crowd screaming, crucify him, give us Barabbas instead. All of this juicy detail might seem strange at first, especially if we expect from the Scriptures something more set apart, something more holy than the messiness of politics today. Certainly would seem strange if we expect Jesus to come from a simpler time, a nobler time than today. Or maybe we just haven't given it much thought. But whatever we expect from this story, intrigue, politics, this is what we get from Luke. A vividly human picture of a remarkably human trial. Justice isn't blind here. In fact, we get politically motivated leaders, a politically motivated set of judges, a roaring crowd, no impartial jury by Jesus' peers. They're hungry for judgment. But the question, which isn't natural to ask, is why Luke bothers to give us this detail? Why, why would Luke include all of this when these two chapters that we just heard could have been filled with more teaching from Jesus? After all, John says there was plenty more to tell in his gospel why mention the friendship of Herod and Pilate? What does it have to do with the salvation of the world? The anger of the chief priests, even that, why include it? Surely these two chapters could have been filled with something more positive, uplifting, encouraging. But instead we get the darkness of the human heart on full display. Well, as David Schmidt of Concordia Seminary suggests, Luke's storytelling, his focus on these dark details, functions something like a window. Yes, we, we see through the window to the details of the story at hand. The story is there, the trial is there in all of its ugliness, in all of its darkness. But have you ever walked up to a window intending to look out, to see through that window, especially at night. And instead, the light from behind illuminates the glass, and instead, all you see is yourself. When this happens, when you're not expecting it, I find, it's then that you're most likely to, to realize, oh, I'm slouching. Or maybe the bags under your eyes which the lights in the bathroom conveniently mask. It's then that you realize your hair is a mess or your tie is out of place and, and, and you were planning to look through but you can't help but see the flaws in yourself. All it takes for this trick of the light with a simple window is for the darkness outside to be darker than your side. Maybe in this story, all it takes is for the darkness outside to seem darker than the darkness on your side of the window. Sometimes we don't like what we see in our reflection. And I think Luke's storytelling here heightens our ability to see in all of this strangeness, all of this tabloid, social media worthy intrigue, something remarkably human, real, 
uncanny and familiar. Unexpected reflections can reveal unexpected truths about ourselves, truths we might miss when we're stepping in front of the bathroom. But as you expect to, to dive into the story and find out truths about 2,000 years ago, you catch sight of yourself and the truths about yourself and the world today even. We too deal with a lot of the things going on around Jesus. We're certainly asking a lot of the questions which Herod and Pilate were asking, to, asking too. See, in this story, as Jesus stands before that impartial jury, and we watch Pilate deliver Jesus over to their will, the will of the people who, who seem hungry for his punishment, we see the dark reality of the human will. For these people who should be rejoicing at the God who has come to be with them, rejoicing at the justice of God, are delighting in injustice, rejecting the will of God that is standing before them, choosing that an innocent man should suffer and die. In fact, choosing that, that God should suffer and die. Though we might like to recoil from the darkness of this moment, the darkness that we see through that window, the darkness reflects our own heart back to us, subtly inviting us to the painful truth that we sometimes don't like, the will of God that is revealed to us. And the evil on display in that ancient courtroom is not indifferent in kind from the evil in our hearts and our lives and our world especially. Our hearts are similarly fallen. Our wills are similar, similarly evil apart from Christ. We have that same res resistance to the will of God in our own lives. And, and they might not look quite as dark from where we stand, but our hearts, in the reflected light of Christ, seem pretty dark indeed. And there's a, an unsettling similarity which is hard to ignore. But the good news in all of this intrigue in all of this courtroom drama is it's not just a story of the sinful human will, the jury which willed him to die, but this is a story of God's will at work in spite of appearances, in spite of expectations. God is working in the midst of all of this and Jesus, by his own will, by his own choice, stands in that courtroom, subverting the anger, subverting the arrogance of Pilate and Herod, the selfishness of the crowd, for he had prophesied it all. He told us now, over and over, that he would die in this place. He'd be mocked, he'd be beaten, and he'd rise again. We know as all of this happens that, that as much as we might like to disown what is happening to Jesus, to recoil from it, this is in accord with the will that he had proclaimed even long before it happened. He says almost nothing through this entire trial, except, and this is one of the more remarkable elements of it all, I think, you have said so to both Herod and to Pilate. Are you the son of God? You have said so. Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so. This 
answer, I think heightens this passage's role as a kind of unintentional mirror. As we stand before it, the question is not given to Jesus whether he is the Son of God and the, and the King of the Jews. The question falls back on us. What do we say about this man? What does Pilate say? What does Herod say? What does the crowd say? These things become of secondary importance, for they're gone, they're past. They have declared their will for Jesus. Now we must declare ours. Who is he? For after all of this, Pilate declares Jesus innocent. I see no guilt in this man, he says. And yet the crowd cries all the more, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. It is Pilate's silence before that crowd. His refusal to stand up and declare what he sees in Jesus that just nails the final nail into Jesus' cross. For in that silence, as Pilate's question rings in our ears, and Herod's question echoes across time to us, is Jesus the Son of God? Is Jesus the King of the Jews? We have to ask as well, is he lunatic? Is he liar? Is he revolutionary? Or is he Lord? Is he the one who's able to turn darkness into light? Is he the one who's able to save? Is he the one who's able to rise from the dead and forgive sins? Is he the one who's able to predict everything we just saw, subvert everything we just saw, and make even his death be according to his will and for the salvation of those who chose to kill him? In our day, Jesus continues to be put on trial. You go to the office, open up Facebook, visit the family down the street, and the debate starts, who is Jesus? What is his will for us? What is he doing now, even now in our world today in 2021? And our coworkers, our family, and our friends may be the ones who stand up and say, Jesus is a lunatic, or Jesus' will is foolish, or they may be the ones who stand silent as these accusations are hurled against him. But when these questions rise, who are we? Are we silent? Or do we open our mouths and reveal who we believe Jesus to be? Do we join Luke today in confessing Jesus Christ as not just another man caught up in political machinations, but the very Son of God and King of Kings? When Jesus is tried in our day, we who have been transformed by his will, conformed to his will, have the opportunity to shine his light, to reveal the darkness on the other side of the window, and maybe even more the darkness in the hearts of our neighbors and family and friends. But when we do this, we reveal to them not just their own sin, but the Savior who's standing behind them with open arms, ready to receive them into his kingdom forever. By his divine will, as he subverts their plans and transforms our lowly wills, we welcome others to see that same Jesus and to know the very peace of God which passes all understanding 
and yet will guard our hearts and minds in that same Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As we think on this Lord and our will and the ways that we fall short of his will for us, I invite you to now stand and to join in the confession of our sin. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. With God. Take off the sandals from your feet. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. But in the very place where it is said of them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. O Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive us all our sins. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God, and he bestows upon them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you again for joining us for worship, whether you're here on site or online. Just a couple of brief announcements. There are Easter baskets for our homebound members in the narthex available for pickup right now. If you have a relationship with any of our homebound members, or if you don't, we'd love to have you be a blessing to them by bringing these Easter baskets. They were put together by our Sunday school kids just this past Sunday as an opportunity for outreach and service and sharing God's love with this community in the midst of this Lenten season. So again, baskets are in the narthex. Feel free to stop by if you are not here on site right now to pick one up during the week. Next thing I'd like to draw your attention to is just a quick reminder to fill out that Easter survey such that we know how many people will be here at each of the services and we can prepare adequately. The people who are in the sanctuary today will see that things are changing around here and we expect them to change even more leading up to that Easter celebration and the various Holy Week services. Keep an eye on those changes and be prepared for minor changes throughout the worship service as we both prepare to celebrate Easter but return to normal in the midst of the pandemic. Finally, community garden plots are available. If you are the kind of person who loves to garden, or even if you're not, we'd love to have you uh, purchase a plot. They're $20 a piece. Uh, try out your green thumb and see how it goes. Uh, the Water is available on site and application forms are available in the church office. As always, offerings on these midweek Lenten services go towards supporting church workers uh, who are preparing for, who, who are in the midst of their education, both Aaron Levenhagen at Concordia Seminary and Sam Trammell as he continues his SMP program through Concordia Seminary as well. So if you do provide those offerings uh, on site, feel free to just drop them in and they'll get where they need to go. But if you would like to make an offering online, please do mark it in the special memo field that you are supporting the church work fund at this time. That's it in the way of announcements. So at this time, I invite you to stand as we go to our Lord in prayer. Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. You have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Give ear, O Lord, to the prayers of your people. Almighty God, we acknowledge your great goodness toward us and praise you for the mercy and grace that you have shown us. 
we sincerely repent of the sins of this day and for those of the past. Pardon our offenses, correct and reform what is lacking in us, and help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of, the, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we may with faithful perseverance receive from you our, our sorrows as well as our joys, knowing that health and sickness, riches and poverty and all things come by permission of your fatherly hand. Keep us this day under your pr protective care and preserve us securely trusting in your everlasting goodness and love. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our day in our worship service comes to an end, let us pray for the peace and stillness that God alone can offer. O Lord God, the life of all the living and the strength of those who labor, grant us a night free from all disturbance. Then after a time of quiet slumber, we may by your goodness be prepared for a new day. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. We share our sign of peace with those around us.